Hello everybody, this is going to be a quick but hopefully insightful analysis on the poem Look We Have Coming to Dover. Um, this is for the Edexcel Poems of the Decade Anthology for AS, um, but also A2 if you're retaking. So, you probably have already looked at the poem, so hopefully let's add to it and just get, get a little bit more stuck in to who the poet is. So Dowagent Nagar was born in 1966 in London. In the early 90s, he finished his MA in English at Royal Holloway University of London in uh, Egham, Surrey. And he had some early publications, I should say, rather than collections in the 2000s. Um, look, we have coming to Dover, which he's reading here. It was his debut in 2007. So it took a long time. He In, in that time between, he was just he was just an ordinary person doing fairly, um, fairly ordinary jobs. And I don't know what those were, though. Okay. His poems playfully use vernacular language with the voice of the poetic speaker often appearing on the page, how they sound. So um, there are countless examples of that. And um, and look, we have coming to Dover uses some certain elements of that, of that kind of vernacular voice. His poems deal, deal with the relationships between men and women, uh, 20th century immigration history and contemporary post-colonial Britain. Um, so let's unpack a little bit more about what was said about look what we have coming to Dover when it was first published. So it was, there we go, right. Um, the blurb says, look we have coming to Dover is the most acclaimed debut collection of poetry published in recent years, as well as one of the most relevant and accessible. Nagra, whose own parents came to England from the from the Punjab in the 1950s, draws on both English and Indian English traditions to tell stories of alienation, assimilation, aspiration, and love. Okay, so those those four terms. Alienation, so uh, alienation can be uh, understood in many different ways, but it's um, variously to be estranged from um, the community in which you work and the things that you produce as well. So if you're an immigrant doing kind of jobs that are menial, repetitive, um, that's a concern about it, of alienation. Um, this is a word that has a, is very multivalent. It means lots of things to different people. Assimilation, kind of uh, assimilating into English society, uh, perhaps losing something of your original, um, your parents' history or your family history in the process. Aspiration, aspiring to not only greater financial security, but also perhaps other things like uh, education, more prestige. A job which maybe doesn't pay necessarily too much more, but is also uh, is is well thought of, um, and and love, which I don't necessarily need to unpack, but I I think um, it can be left there for the moment. Okay, and from a stowaway's first footprint on the Dover beach to the disenchantment of subsequent generations. So let's talk a little bit more of that disenchantment of subsequent generations. And Nagra is a second generation of Punjab parents. So let's talk a little bit more about the last 20 years or so. Um, very broadly, I know this is very, very broad brushstrokes, but um, new labour is often is often considered uh, in recent history as uh, pro-immigration, but uh, this is often not the case. It, it did demonise asylum seekers, it forced them to use um, vouchers when shopping for food, and it only allowed them to spend those vouchers on items it considered essential. So it also uh, indulged in a kind of rhetoric of British jobs for British workers and um, in many ways it had a lot of problems. It set the ground for what came after. So in two 2008 there was a financial crash and what happened was broadly there was a coalition government led by David Cameron and Nick Clegg and they basically un unleashed austerity on um, reigning in spending in in a lot of towns in in across across uh, across britain and this um ate into uh, essential public services p people's living standards and, and their sense of security and prosperity you could say uh, anti immigrant feelings uh, and hate crimes have have um especially after the the brexit decision in 2016 um have kind of reached uh continuing heights. There were the hostile environment policies um, from Theresa May, who was Home Secretary, um, and she was responsible. She oversaw um, and greenlit the go-home vans in um, high immigrant neighbourhoods. 
and she justified this on the, on the grounds that no one should be here illegally. So we've had more restrictive immigration for, let's say you're an international student who wants to um, get a visa to come and study in the UK, you'll have to go through more tests now. There was also the Windrush scandal in which the British state um, misplaced or lost documents relating to hundreds of cases of those granted permission to stay. Um, many of them were from co uh, the Caribbean uh, and they were Commonwealth citizens, so they had uh, a right to stay in Britain and access services, um, but they were denied um, you know, a access to hospitals, to housing, to welfare and things like this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more. That's, that's the context broadly sketched. Okay, so this is the poem, Look We Have Coming to Dover. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and just read it and then we can sort of analyze and unpick the language from um, the point of view of, uh, well, of language and then we'll look at form and structure as well. So, so various, so beautiful, so new. Stowed in the sea to invade, the alfresco lash of a diesel breeze, ratcheting speed into the tide, brought with gobfuls of surf lemmed by cushy come and go, tourists proud on the cruisers, lauding the ministered waves. Seagull and shoal life, vexing their blarneys upon our huddled camouflage past the vast crumble of scummed cliffs, scramming on mulch as thunder and bladders, yobbish rain and wind on our escaped, hutched in a Bedford van. Seasons or years we reap inland, unclocked by the national eye, or stabs in the back, teeming for breathing, sweeps of grass through the whistling asthma of parks, burdened, ennobled, polling sparks across pylon and pylon. Swarms of us grafting in, the black within, sh of, within shot of the moon's spotlight, banking on the miracle of sun. Span its rainbow, passport us to life. Only then can it be human to hoik ourselves, barefaced for the clear. Imagine my love and I, our sundry others, Blared in on the cash, blared in on the cash, even. Of our beeswax calves, our crash clothes, free. We raise our charged glasses over unparasoled tables, east, babbling our lingos, flecked by the chalk of Britannia. Okay. So that was Look We Have Coming to Dover. And as you can see here, I have many uh, annotations. And um, you, the, th the first thing that you may notice about a poem, and you should notice about a poem, is the, the gra grammatically incorrect title. Um, look who we have coming to Dover, no? So does it mimic the voice of a person, an immigrant, for, for whom, um, you should say if you don't know the identity, English is a learned language. Does it mimic a declarative view of someone already at Dover? So look, we have someone at, uh, we have some, you know, someone coming there. Um, or could it be a claim of possession too? It could be all, all of these at the same time. Um, so let's look at uh, language structure and form. Uh, let's go with form first, because most don't analyze form. And this is a poem in which form isn't, um, isn't so uh, prominently, it's not such a big, um, it's, a, it's a blank verse. Um, it doesn't appear to be in any particular kind of, um, in any kind of form, um, like a, like a sonnet or a qu couplet or quatrains or anything like that. But what it does have is often um, five lines. So we can we can see that in each of the stanzas, five lines, and there's five times five, so twenty five. And then there's the epigraph from Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. Um, so it has five standards of five lines each. In what appears to be uh, blank verse. So the five, the five uh, si signification of five could be important, but let's talk a little bit, a bit more about that epigraph, the thing that comes before the epi, um, graph meaning writing, epi meaning before, from a a Matthew Arnold, which is uh, just worth uh, just just chatting about a little bit more. So the poem is in dialogue with um, Matthew Arnold, and Matthew Arnold, for all of you out there, is. Um, This man, he was uh, an inspector of schools and he wrote a book um, which is quite well known called Culture and Anarchy. So, but in the poems over Beach, the, the, the speaker um, or the, the poet 
stands on the edge of a civilised England, imagining the withdrawal of religion from our shores and the descent into conflict and disorder he thinks must follow if you got rid of um, the civilised England uh, that's Christian and um, and so on. So we're, we're arguably in that position. But Nagra is very clever and he has a, a poem that um, uh, dramat- dramatises a kind of a, a sort of replacement, if you like, of um, immigrants into the country. Um, and it's playful, but it's also serious, this poem. So Matthew Arnold is someone who's typically considered um, elitist, classist, um, and very um, proud of the English. Um, he's conservative with a small c, so he wants to sort of preserve the um, the culture that's been handed down to us. Um, so let's... Arnold was, to a later, greater and lesser extent, all of those things. So why has uh, Nagra used him? So when it comes to the culture, uh, idea of... Uh, question of culture, he's a figure who... Um, many have to at least um, cite because he was um, he's been um, important even to opposition um, groups or figures who don't share in his views so Raymond Williams said uh, he was another cultural theorist in the 20th century um, Arnold was among those who at the point of eruption of a qualitatively new social order put many of the right questions to it but of course came out with the wrong answers. So questions of what we should teach um, to to the younger generation is, is actually um, one of the things Arnold considered. And um, the definition of culture, his definition of culture, uh, Arnold's, um, was the best that has been thought and said or known in the world. So how, how would, you, would you go about um, knowing what that was? Arnold thought it was the collection of outstanding uh, artistic and literary works um, which enhance um, our moral, intellectual and spiritual qualities uh, of those who, who, who would read them and study them. And this this is this canon, this group, um, is an exclusive club. It's mostly English, it's mostly white, it's mostly male. Um, for, for Arnold, it's preferably Anglican, Church of England, and definitely not immigrant or working class, and definitely not Dalgent Nagra. So, that for Nagra to use this so various, so beautiful, so new, and to sort of ironically repurpose it for um, his own view of the newcomers that are in this poem, perhaps, or for his view of immigration, is quite uh, tongue-in-cheek, it's playful. Um, and it's ironic because there's a distance between the original meaning and the uh, the intended the repurposed meaning. There's a discrepancy there. So that's interesting, I think. And if you're interested in uh, the idea of the competing views of culture, which affects the kinds of the kinds of poems that get taught in A-level, then I recommend you have a look at a book that's coming out this February um, from Dr. Asha Rogers um, called State Sponsored Literature, um, which is very interesting. Okay, but let's talk about structure now. So, as we've said, five, five lines, um, five standards, each stanza's meter gradually grows from shorter lot to lot to longer lines before breaking for the next stanza. This may mimic the ebb and flow of waves and tides for some readers, um, with this gradual but clear flow and change, perhaps. It may also signal a movement of people across the world, throughout history, and different cycles of immigration and emigration before a decisive break in the stanza. So the line length varies, and the is a a repetition of five five stanzas, five lines. Could this be a reference to the five oceans of the world, which have been vital to traditional movement and travel? Perhaps speculation. We don't we don't uh, we don't need this kind of speculation in our essay. It's just to get you thinking. But it's it's a it's a compelling idea, maybe. There's also the frequent use of commas and hyphens throughout the poem. So there's the the exclamation point in uh, the title. But the commas and hyphens may represent the idea of diversity and change within society due to the frequent use of these different types of punctuation. I'm not entirely sold on this idea myself. Some readers could interpret this as the poem considering foreign languages and speech, with these pauses representing the thinking and consideration for new words when a non-native speaker is using another language. 
So when you learn a new language, you're kind of rendered um, a bit helpless. You're kind of reduced to the status of a child, actually. Um, if anyone's ever tried to use learn a language, um, so these pieces of in punctuation are generally used to join sentences and words together. Um, in comparison to the full breaks with caesura, such as full stops and ex exclamation marks. So I'll leave that as it may. It's just something there to consider. And language. So in Dover Beach, the surrounding sea is presented as being beautiful, calm and tranquil. Um, Nagra, the look we have in coming to Dover, it sort of inverses this. The sea has gobfuls as if it's um, ready to reject it from its mouth in its flemmed water. Dover's cliffs are crumbling and scummed, so deeply unpleasant kind of uh, lexical field. The landscape has become polluted by an ugly hostility to immigrants, or perhaps it was always like that. And even the thunder unbladders Yobbish rain, so it's kind of, um, it's a sort of disgusting rejectamenta, we'd say, um, rejectamenta being spelt like this. The stuff no one wants is being unloaded. Um, the thunder is unblathering. It's Yobesh rain. The um, the sea has gobfuls of phlegm water. It's it's deeply unpleasant imagery. So let's consider how the immigrants are described. They're stowed in the sea and are and hutched, and they try to go under the radar when they when they arrive. They are doing something dangerous, fearing a stab in the back. So um, maybe from officials, their friends, or being caught in the spotlight of the moon. Okay, spotlight of the moon, it's almost like the moon is surveilling them. Nagra also uses also uses the sorts of metaphors employed insidiously by racists to whip up fear of immigration. He imagines that the immig immigrants invade in de dehumanized swarms. Okay, so, however, this poem understands, however obliquely, so however little, uh, and and um, indirectly, that people are not statistics. Nagar's poem registers the the perils and pitfalls, as well as the playfulness and the self-aware expectations of addressing immigrants in the third person. So as as they as the pronoun they, they there isn't one person's thoughts probes, probes. There's only just the speaker, and this speaker registers the language um, or discourses of those hostile to multiculturalism or further immigration. So there, there is the use of swarms, as though uh, people were borderless, borderless insects being able to move in large clusters. Such group nouns for illegal immigrants have been found um, from the mouths of politicians like David Cameron in recent off-the-record comments, well not so recent, but when he was Prime Minister. Um, so what we see is the entry of the illegal immigrant against the luxury which surrounds the come and go tourists who can, as it were, come and go. The kind of mobility and each with ease with which was, with which tourists um, can uh, travel with acceptable and pow powerful tra passports, travel documents, is uh, signalled in the image of the al fresco lash of the diesel breeze. Readers do not have to be Italiophiles to know al fresco it means open air. Conventionally, the expression in modern English is al fresco dining, the kind of place you'd expect to see cushy come and go tourists. Um, perhaps the the use of diesel breeze is about power, about kind of having a kind of um, material resources providing comfort and speed. However, this poem understands, however obliquely, however narrowly, and without a direct comment on it, statement on it, that people are not statistics. So. These immigrants, Nago's poem seems self-aware and understanding that they, they it seems self-aware about recording the perils and pitfalls of addressing immigrants, immigrants in the third person as, as they. There is never one person's thoughts probe, there is never one immigrant's thoughts or feelings probes, only the speakers, and we don't know who this speaker really is. And this speaker registers the language or discourses of those hostile to multiculturalism and further immigration. Why else would they use swarms, as though people were borderless insects being able to move around in large clusters? Such group nouns for illegal immigrants or immigrants generally has been found um, from the mouths of prominent British politicians. So David Cameron, when he was Prime Minister, 
um, was believed to have made such comments off the record, i.e. when he's not making an, an official speech. What we see is the entry of the illegal immigrant against the kind of relative luxury which surrounds the come and go tourists. So we always put relative luxury. Um, there's not much description of luxury, that's why. Um, there's, there is hyper mobility and ease with which uh, tourists with acceptable and um, powerful passports um, uh, come and go. It's signaled in the imagery of the al fresco lash of the diesel breeze. Just that one phrase. So we don't have, we could make, we could either decide not to make a big uh, deal about it, but I think it's worth analysing. So readers do not have to be Italiophiles, you don't have to love Italy to know al fresco, or know Italian as well. To know a fresco means open air, and it's using the expression in contemporary English of al fresco dining, of eating outside, i.e. on a on a deck of a boat or a ferry maybe. Or This is the kind of place you'd cut, you expect to see cushy come and go tourists. If the diesel breeze is about power or material resources providing comfort, this first stanza's line has more to do with the kind of um, kind of a slightly rank residue and side effects of power. Um, it's that's something to consider if you're writing perhaps about a question about about power or about inequality, um, which were these notes were taken from. Um, even in these sort of benign kind of innocent experiences of the Taurus, um, you could say um, those who are stowed away, not so far away, are choking with smoke. Um, but that's all uh, speculative. Um, they are obviously stowed away. We don't know if they're necessarily choking, but it would be in conditions that would be potentially life endangering, um, as the journeys of many migrants often are. Um, in using the examples of smuggled persons alone and not kind of official immigration, Nagra potentially opens himself up to the jeopardy or, or opportunity, on the other hand, of talking about immigration as a whole. Um, so we're not he's not talking about immigration as a whole. Many there are many who um, have to go through the the the, the kind of uh, procedures of official kind of uh, visa documentation. And they many people spend many many years going through that that process of trying to get citizen, citizenship as well. Um, however, as the arrivals appear to be getting on with life, the parks are flowing their whistling asthma. Some uh, there's some negativity in the possible threat of being here, uh, as though whether legal or not, there are potentially unwanted gazes and confrontations or worse. So, um, the whistling asthma signals anxiety, um, fear even in a place of leisure like the park. Okay, so um, we can talk a little bit more about this theme um, in um, with the idea of um, social death. So sociologists use this, this term. It's basically the condition, and, and the, variation, the definitions vary, but it's the condition of people not being fully accepted as human by wider society and excluded for it. Um, Nagra's poem seems to register um, the kind of um, the kind of divisions that go on. Um, I've said economic apartheid. I don't know if I'd go that far, but the kind of um, the divisions, the deep divisions, as people strive for the metaphorical or literal passport to life. So people do this journey for the the ability to become more human, to have more money. Um, to see their children go on to do uh, things that they had they could only they couldn't even conceive of or dreamt of. So the undescribed and unnamed arrivals graft so work very hard. Corner and that's, that has connotations of less than respectable hustling. It's not wage tax work uh, in the black within shot of the moon spotlight. This spotlight of the moon is watchful and omnipresent, just like a prison's or a patrol boats would be and it could be taken as a kind of maximum intensity of light or surveillance um the kind of arri arrivals are willing to be um well they're, they're, they're not they're not in it they're willing to incur it but they're um they're uh, they're banking on the miracle of sun otherwise metaphorical of, of promise so the metaphor is the 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 verb is banking as a it's a financial kind of it's both financial and kind of um 
a financial kind of uh, expression, but it's also a kind of transcendent um, spiritual kind of language as well. The miracle of sun, banking on the miracle of sun. So it's kind of banking on uh, just promise generally, but also banking meaning, I don't know, con it has connotations of financial prosperity as well. Okay. So otherwise, metaphorical of promise, uh, perhaps a false or misjudged one, as we will suggest, where they will deposit their earnings, um, perhaps as worthwhile to the majority of nations. Only they can. Then only then it can be human to hoik ourselves up, spare face to the clear. So only when they have money, um, will it be worthwhile to hoik to to kind of um, pull yourself up. It's almost like the uh, the allegory of Plato's allegory of the cave, where they they come out into outside of the darkness and into the miracle of sunshine and rainbow spanning. Um, so they must do it for themselves, though. That's the, the what's implied in the word hoik. For individualism, the idea of that you get on with yourself, get on with it yourself, is 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 in the ascendant since in stature. So solidarity and union jobs are certainly not around for them. If they're illegal immigrant, immigrants, and also if the, even if they were, they're few and far between. So the idea that you can um, collectively gang up on the managers for better paying conditions with a union um, is, uh, is that that power has been eroded in many jobs, um, and many because of the changing nature of work as well. A lot of jobs don't have unions. So think about delivery drivers as well, um, which have tried to form unions. Anyway. In any case, this is a rather tongue-in-cheek image, given the introduction to Dover we would already read, because it's um, it's not a it's not a, a miracle a miracle kind of a radiant scene. It's a it's a it's a Britain that's scummed and falling apart. A disgusting and quite possibly more realistic introduction to Britain, which emphasises their fears and confusion. However, hoiking the act of abrupt pulling is also joined by the same lexical field of suspicion and surveillance, so hoiking to grab someone where the spotlight of the moon and the cover of darkness reign. Hoiking is not unlike border agents and immigration what uh, border agents and immigration officials might do in place, places where um, mismanagement and cruelty has been alleged. So think about all of those immigration removal centres that you may have not heard about, you may have heard of, um, but we do a lot of um, we do a lot of hoiking already um, and immigrants don't necessarily need to do that for themselves, but they are trying to do that when they're pulling themselves up. Okay. So what I'm trying to do there is just draw in a lexical field of similar words together um, and offer kind of um, an, an analysis on what, what I think is going on. So it's, it's as we've said, it's, it's contradictory. Um, there's this radiant um, promise, but uh, is there really? Um, so what kind of Britain is it really? Through a tone of wild false optimism, the last stanza hints at the difficulties of life of, uh, in assimilation and exacting incompatible circumstances in which identities, including language, are marked by false qualities of the new environment. We raised our charged glasses over unparasoled tables, east, babbling our lingos, flecked by the chalk of Britannia. So there's a sense of triumph in having made it and making it, but there's accompanied by the invitation to see what their journey has been like. Um, so they're raising their glasses east, our charged glasses over unparasoled table east. So come and take a look, as if to say, come and take a look. Just as in Dover Beach, the poet turns to his love at the end. Um, is there a sense of, of hope in the final verse? So there's a sense in which um, they've, they've retained their, their, their lingos. And they're raising our glass, their glasses over unparasoled tables. So unparasoled might suggest that they're these are not luxury tables with the, with the big luxury parasol umbrella, but there is a sense of having some measure of stability. So that's my two cents on it. I um, hope you've um, you could uh, withstand all of my um, typos and everything. But um, let me know what you think and if you'd like to see more. Okay, thanks very much. I can always send this out again too this document. Okay, until next time.